my name is Holly Lawford Smith. I'm a political philosopher at the University of Melbourne and I'm teaching a new undergraduate course in feminism this year and I asked uh, Vaishnavi Sundar if I could interview her as part of that course. Uh, Vaishnavi is a documentary filmmaker and feminist activist living in India. Her film, uh, But What Was She Wearing, was the first feature-length documentary about workplace sexual harassment in India. I'm just going to quickly show you how uh, you can find it. So um, if you search the title of the film, the second result is a Medium post, um, and there's a link through to the film at Gumroad there, which is this first tab here. And if you just want to watch the trailer and get tantalized into watching the rest, um, there's a trailer here on YouTube as well. Um, great, so Vaishnavi has been kind enough to agree to speak with us uh, about her film and about feminism in India. So thanks so much for, um, for doing that. My pleasure. Um, great, so the first thing I wanted to ask you about, there was a um, webinar recently that you were a speaker in and I remember that the host asked all of the panelists to talk about how the um, cultural and legal changes around sex self-identification were affecting women-only spaces in, uh, in their countries um, and spaces like domestic violence refuges. And your answer really stood out to me um, because you said that in India there are hardly any uh, domestic violence refuges in the first place. So uh, Indian feminists' concerns weren't really with people self iding <laughs> into those spaces. Um, so that was... Yeah, so that was really interesting for me just to get a sense of how the uh, things are different in, in, our, in our countries. Um, but of course, then I wanted to know more about that. Um, so maybe sure. we could start there. So what exactly does that mean? Are there refuges uh, at all? Um, are there some run by women volunteers, um, bef like, but just not state funded? Or are there, are there basically none? Um, how common are they and what kinds of impact does that have on the women who are subject to abuse? Because I assume that there are still a, a many such women. Oh yeah, definitely. Okay, um, I want to just lay uh, a landscape of, uh, uh, of in the Indian uh, social, cultural, political uh, atmosphere <clears throat> because that's very important in understanding everything that I'm going to be speaking uh, during this entire conversation of ours. Yeah. Uh, we are uh, a huge country, no doubt, uh, but we are divided. We are also a federal union. Uh, the system is pretty similar to that of the US. We have a center and then we have states. States have their own economy. We have 28 states and we have eight union territories. And under each state and union territories, there are you know, district level, village level, panchayats and things like that. So we are, uh, there is a center, but then it also sort of trickles down to the very, very small administrative, uh, uh, you know, uh, setup uh, down in the rural area. Mm -hmm. That being said, <clears throat> we also have uh, various ways in which we are different. Um, we have religious differences, we have caste-based differences, and we have region-based differences. So to give you an example, there is a northeast part of India, um, where which is which is sort of closer to in 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 the map, it's closer to China, and the people there kind of have uh, uh, Mongolia features. Um, mm -hmm. So when those women come to the mainland for education or career, they often get um, racially oppressed. Mm -hmm. They get called chinkies, and they get called chow means and noodles and things like that because they sort of look Asian, which is funny because we are Indians. Mm -hmm. I don't get that, but this is within India. Mm -hmm. And we have um, nine major religions, and then there are so many different faiths, and one religion slash faith cannot stand the other. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, there is the caste. Um, I mean, you can say that... To understand India, you've got to understand the caste system. If you understand the caste system, I think a lot of what's going on in India will just make sense very crystal clearly. Mm -hmm. um, we have a lot of castes, and then there are subcastes, and then there are caste-based oppressions that people go through, especially women. Can I so there's, uh, can I just get you to explain that because I've been using caste in the in the course to refer to women like uh, women as a caste rather than women as a class. So that it might be slightly confusing for the students what this other m more mainstream meaning is. Sure. Um, the predominant religion is Hinduism uh, 
in India. And uh, Hinduism sort of defines the caste system such uh, in such a way that there is this god called Brahma, who is the god of creation. Mm -hmm. And when he created human beings, uh, he created them out of different parts of his body. That's a myth. And from the head came the Brahmins, who are the upper caste people. They get all the social, economical, cultural capital, all opportunities. There is absolutely um, nothing that holds them back. We also need to understand that when we talk about uh, caste privilege, the woman of said caste is always under the men, of mm -hmm. course. So an upper class, upper caste man is definitely more privileged than an upper caste woman. Mm -hmm. But an upper caste woman is probably a lot more privileged than a lower caste man. I see. But that does not stop abuse from happening. Uh, abuse knows no um, boundary. It can just happen anyway. Anyway, Lord Brahma's head gave birth to Brahmins, the upper caste people. And then they are, you know, they are the teachers, they are the intellectuals, they are believed to uh, know everything. They're known to be pure. And then came the Kshatriyas, they are the warriors or the ruler. rulers, they're supposed to be uh, from Brahma's arms. Mm -hmm. And then the third section is the Vaishyas, they are the traders, your business people, your uh, you know sellers and so on. And they are um, created from Brahma's thighs. And then at the, at the bottom of the heap were the Shudras, the Shudras who came from the feet of Brahma. They are known to be... Um, set aside for the menial jobs, mm -hmm. jobs that the top three categories are not interested in doing. Apart from these four categories, there is something called as the untouchable, just even lower than the Shudras. The untouchables, as the word explains, are uh, the most oppressed community in India. And in that, you can imagine if there is a handicapped woman, mm -hmm. he could be the epitome of uh, maximum oppression in a, in a country like ours is any so, of is any of those caste lines tracking real differences between people like ethnicity race anything else or are they just kind of constructed as job categories D does that make sense like yes 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 i mean it the myth originates as a job category but then everything here everything your survival depends on what caste you belong to okay if you walk into a room uh, the chances of people standing up for you versus the chances of people kicking you out comes down to the caste. But what determines which caste a person ends up in? Chance of birth. Okay, um, so it's inherited from your parents. Yeah, okay. Yes, okay. Yes. Great. You can't denounce privilege because it sticks to you. You can't. You can only you can only challenge it. But you, so it's the same for people belonging to the lower caste as well. You know, you can't kick it out. You can't just identify out of it. It's just with you. You die as a lower caste person. Got that's it. the that's a that's the brutal reality of it, and that is why caste is so important in India. And whenever whenever question of uh, you know Western feminism comes into picture and trying to sort of template things in developing countries, I think this is where the biggest hurdle is because you can't break caste, you can't break through caste and try and implement something for women um, as an exclusive thing, as a sex based thing, because there are so many other hurdles that women don't care about. Um, I see. They, do, they don't care about uh, a, a workplace that is free of harassment because they don't have food on their plate and she doesn't have contraception available at her disposal and she has got her fourth child coming and her husband's an abusive alcoholic you know so mm -hmm. at that time i'm not thinking i'm a vegetable seller on the street i'm not thinking there is this man who's flashing at me right now i'm just going to ignore it and try and sell and make some money because tonight i've got to feed four of my kids got it so Everything comes down to what caste you belong to. Um, you know what they call it as affirmative actions and reservations are in place. But it is still true that um, the upper class, upper caste people continue to oppress the lower caste people. You know, they, they don't touch them. It still happens. 2020, it still happens. They don't allow them to come through the house. They're supposed to take a, take a different road and they're not supposed to drink from the same glass as the La the owner of the house drinks you know just uh, last week there was this case where uh, this there's, there's a there's a woman that by mistake touched the bucket to fill water mm -hmm. a woman touched it by mistake she was beaten to death by the village people wow so i mean this is normal here this is absolutely normal here so when we hear about caste violence it has become so rampant that people have gone numb to it mm -hmm. 
but but then this is the one thing that we should be talking about over and over and over again yeah uh, it comes down to the people belonging to that caste to keep talking about it but that's false it's everybody's prerogative because if I'm talking about women's sex based rights, I'm talking about the last woman here. Mm -hmm. And if she is shackled because of caste, I have to try and think of ways to get her to break that shackle first and then talk about giving her sex based rights. Yeah. So there are um, more than 3,000 castes and 25,000 sub castes, and each have a very, very specific occupation. So, for example, there's this one caste that only picks shit from the side of the streets. That's their job. Manual scavenging is their job. You can't not do that job. You will not get a job anywhere else. Wow. You can try and break that uh, caste cycle and educate yourself. You can become an engineer, but there have been cases where they look at you, they see that uh, you may be an engineer, but they see that based on your name, you belong to certain caste. There have been cases where the kids have been told to go wash the toilet in the engineering colleges because that's where he belongs. Wow. Yeah, so yeah. is the thought then that it's it's kind of inconceivable to even think about things like domestic violence shelters or services for women given these caste distinctions and the fact that women are also upholding them yep. i see yep. um and you should also understand that um we we are not a 100 percent literate country right so for a woman to understand that there is an option that she could actually seek help is non-existent she doesn't read. She doesn't understand that there is help. Yeah. She believes that's her fate. And sometimes if she can't take it anymore, she kills herself. That's her life. And sometimes her life starts and ends in that little village. And the only person she knows is this ab uh, abusive husband who might be 20, 30 years older than her and her parents who don't want her anymore because they've, been, they've, they've given her away for marriage. Yeah. They don't want her anymore. That's a liability. So he, she is now his headache. Even if she's getting beaten up, the family ensures, uh, Susan Brown Miller has written about it, the family ensures that uh, the girl gets sent back because uh, the transaction has already taken place, so you can't undo it. Given that we are divided uh, in, 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 this, in, this, in this multitude of ways, yeah. uh, so it's sometimes hard to talk about exclusive sex-based oppression that women face in India when we it is, a it is our prerogative to talk about other ways in which we are oppressed to eventually come to, um, you know, uh, sex-based rights. Yeah. So um, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about the women-specific legislations that are available in India. Now, mind you, a significant population of our country resides in the rural area who probably cannot read at all. Okay. Okay, so these legislations, these acts that are getting passed is in the hope that some woman in some remote corner of some village in uh, Uttar Pradesh will be able to benefit from it, but the chances of it is nearly none, mm -hmm. uh, not in this lifetime for her. So the, the, the women-specific legislation, which is considered to be very, very comprehensive, I should tell you that, uh, the Indian legislations have come, uh, each legislation has come after a decade of two decades of struggle and so many amendments and rewritings and rewriting so many women you know going out of the way to make sure that the last detail is put in so the legislation is spot on yeah but the implementation is a big work i see so the the women specific legislations here is very interesting actually uh, the trafficking act uh, that you know you you can't you can't traffic children from one state to another and from nearby countries to another that's like a very very important uh, women specific legislation here dowry prohibition um, the, the, that you should not um, force somebody to give dowry or the family shouldn't demand dowry uh, in the exchange of uh, you know this whole marriage transaction is is a law right now because there were just so many deaths that the government had to intervene yeah. and make a legislation. Um, that's another important one. And we have something called Indecent Representation of Women in Media Act. Mm -hmm. I should add that uh, all this legislation that I do read out is, is there, but all the things that it is claiming to prohibit is not prohibited at all. Right. Because dowry does happen even now. Um, children get trafficked even now and you know you get you have an idea of how bollywood functions bollywood uh, and our advertisements function women talk uh, women say these lyrics in bollywood movies where they say i am chicken have me with your alcohol 
that's like your literal translation of one of the song's lyrics. So, um, and then you have Saki that got prohibited. Thankfully, that doesn't happen anymore. Yeah. Uh, or, or we think. Uh, and then there is this uh, Domestic Violence Act, which is again filled with all kinds of problems. There is uh, Sexual Harassment of Women at Workplace Act that came only in 2013, right now. Yeah. Um, we, I will talk in detail about that because your question is about that. Yeah. And the criminal law about this, uh, you know, anti-rape law, which happened after the Delhi rape case uh, in 2012. And in 2013, they passed this act. In 2013, they thought that, well, rape is an issue in India. Maybe we should pass a legislation about it. So in 2013, they passed it. I mean, Anyways. it's quite interesting that there's, I mean, it's just, I mean, kind of fascinating that there's progress at that particular point and then not, you know, because it is quite a triumph to be able to get these sorts of things in law, right? But then, of course, if no one's really policing them properly, it, it, it also doesn't help very much. So, Exactly, but I wouldn't even think that it is progressive that these laws are in place right now. Because the toil uh, and, and the amount of time and effort and lives uh, of women that went behind it, it right. doesn't seem like a triumph after all. Yeah. It, feels like, uh, it feels like betrayal, if anything. 20 years of somebody's life is not a joke. There are women who have literally given their life out to make sure that there is a legislation passed, and for what? Yeah, right. If it's not implemented, then yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, so, that's uh, that's a good segue, I think, into talking more about the workplace harassment law yes, in particular. So, um, yeah. so you, you're in your documentary, you interviewed like a huge number of women um, to talk about uh, their involvement in various ways in the in the process of, I guess, trying to implement that new new law. Um, so people who had been harassed, people who were on the new committee that was set up to help with these cases, or people who had been helping women who had been harassed. Um, yeah. So can you tell us a bit about the new law, a bit about what was in place before it, if anything, when it came to workplace sexual harassment? And then just, I guess, what, what any thoughts are that you have now after you've done so much speaking with so many women about this? Sure. Um, just to quickly go back to the uh, shelter part, there are some shelters, um, government uh, instituted shelters, but uh, um, there have been cases of uh, sexual violence happening inside the shelters. So just now, a couple of days ago during the lockdown, uh, in Kanpur, there was a shelter where uh, uh, 57 children were there, well, women and children were there, out of which uh, three people were uh, um, found out that, the, it was found out that three people were pregnant and one had HIV positive. So this is this is the state sanctioned uh, shelters that are available and these house very few people because there is always dearth of space whenever women have to you know secret themselves. There is always dearth because in the, India is a huge country. Yeah. There are some private shelters, but they are also always full. So I just wanted to sort of wrap up the previous question. Okay. Yeah. So uh, the Sexual Harassment Act it came in 2013, but it came again after two decades of struggle. There was a, sec uh, a social worker called Bauri Devi in Rajasthan. This is a northern state in India. Uh, her work was, she was working with an organization, a non-governmental organization that was out on, on uh, the road in villages to stop uh, child marriages from happening. And uh, she was one of the worker there, social worker there, and there was a family that was actually indulging in one and she tried to intervene and stop it. The family got pissed off uh, and Bambi they were belonging to a lower caste, the men wanted to teach her a lesson. So they raped her at her, this is her work, uh, this, she's doing her work. Mm -hmm. They raped her and beat up her husband, made the husband watch it, and you know the whole. They they, they make sure a spectacle is put up, put up all the time. So yeah. that happened. And Pavri Devi uh, in 1992 went to uh, Supreme Court in order to seek redress for it because the Rajasthan government said that this doesn't hold any water. Wow. So the Supreme Court allowed a guideline. It's not a legislation. It it allowed a guideline as to who who a woman is. What is a workplace? Uh, what what does harassment mean? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, if 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 what are the things that you should not do? What mm -hmm. are the things that you should not ask a woman while you're recruiting her or having her in the job and she's going out for maternity? It was pretty detailed. Yeah. Um, but it was not a legislation. Therefore, people were not feeling any obligation to uphold it. Not that there is a legislation now; people are upholding it. But that's besides the point. Yeah. Um, but the guidelines seem to work as a stopgap. Uh, a situation where we we know something is grossly going wrong and this came as a solution for the time being and the fight was still on and uh, the activists and the uh, social workers that worked for Bhavani Devi's redress cell continued to work till they passed this as a legislation only in 2013. So now there is an act 
uh, and uh, anybody <clears throat> and the definition of uh, a working woman is clearly defined mm -hmm. a definition of what a workplace is clearly defined because not everybody goes to air conditioned office with a hierarchy of human resource and a ceo yeah uh, i'm if i'm out filming on the road i'm that's my workplace and if somebody harasses me there there should be policies in place according to the law mm -hmm. So that was what, uh, so before 1990, 91, 92, that was nothing. It was unheard of. You know, when, when women complain that men are harassing them, it, it is a non-issue. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you would be forced to stay back at home. Uh, back then, you didn't even, you weren't even working, right? Uh, you, at best, you would be um, farming in a land that doesn't even belong to you. You'd be working for a landowner and uh, he would be sort of, uh, being a corrupt man and not giving you your salary, basic salary to even work and till his farm for you. So that being the case, until 92, nobody even raised an issue about it. It happened, it ha It didn't happen in a way that it caused a revolution is what I'm trying to say. Women have always complained, but it, only in 92 when Bhavi Devi case happened, it sort of became like a, yeah. like a, like an avalanche of sort. Yeah. The women that I spoke to are from various uh, demographic, if I can say that. They represent various caste, mm -hmm. uh, various class, uh, the type of industry that they work in, organized, unorganized, uh, because a significant population of India works in an organized sector. Mm -hmm. Only a very, very small percentage have this, you know, office set up. Mm -hmm. They take your farmers, construction laborers, manual laborers, daily wage workers, domestic help, all this filmmakers writers, freelancers, mm -hmm. all this is considered to be unorganized sector. Mm -hmm. And the unorganized sector's uh, viewpoint is often sidelined because when we take a, when we take a sample, we often limit it to urban, educated, upper class, upper class women. So my, I wanted to break that uh, with my film. Yeah. So I basically interviewed all kinds of people and uh, the film is uh, not a positive film at all. Uh, it, it, uh, it really basically tells you the truth now, despite there being an act, things are still bleak for women. And that was the idea I was going with. And I chose this act and I wanted to sort of uh, dissect it because they claim that there is now an act, therefore you can't protest anymore. Right. And that's a huge setback. So it's like saying, why do you, why do you keep complaining? People are harassing you. We've given you an act. What more can we do? Yeah. But that's not how it works. So that's what I wanted to sort of question in my uh, film. And a lot of young people that have watched the film, some good things about the film is that a lot of young women that were harassed are now feeling confident to speak up about it because the film sort of instills in them that it is not their fault. Good. Um, again, this is only people that can understand certain languages are from a certain... My film is a huge failure because a significant percentage of uh, India can't understand my film, can't even make sense of my film. I mean, yeah, I watched the film and I thought it was super interesting and I think it's... Yeah, obviously a real accomplishment to have managed to talk to so many women from d so many different parts of society about this, but also so depressing, right? Because like you say, this stuff is just not like, it's not actually helping women that much in, in the workplace. Um, so there's a lot of work to do. And uh, the, the, sorry, the trouble also is that even if we claim that um, the law has helped somebody, um, I didn't even want to include that in my show because those were very, very rare cases because people keep asking me during uh, film screenings, Q&A, are there any positive cases? Because people always want a happy ending to things. Yeah, yeah. There is no happy ending to women's rights in India. So yeah. I don't, I chose not to include that at all. Yeah. And if you remember in the film, you would have, you would have noticed that I have made sure that I have interviewed people that have access to the top most legal services mm -hmm. to the woman that can't even read. Mm -hmm. Both their situation is pretty much the same. Mm -hmm. They both have no recourse. So all this claim about uh, feminism uh, has in, has come in India. Feminism is taking care of things in India. Um, now women don't need equal rights because they already have equal rights and things like that. It's just such a hogwash. Wow. You watch my film and you hear from these women directly yeah. that that's not true. Yeah. I didn't and know. I didn't know people were claiming that about India. So that's already very interesting. That there's well, the, the urban, urban population at least is. At least the people on Twitter are definitely saying that. Uh, what are you still harping on about women's rights? It, wow. Well, it's yeah. I mean, I find that outrageous when people say it in Australia, and <laughs> it sounds like this. Like you know, there there are some pretty good implementation of certain of the laws on women's rights and 
I mean, so yeah, comparatively, that sounds especially outrageous. Um, yeah, basically, yeah. what they're asking is they're asking you to stop fighting because they're afraid that you might get it. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's a backlash. Um, uh, related to that, I wanted to ask you, and I know this is a bit going to sound like a weird philosopher's question, so it's like, what's so bad about sexual harassment in the workplace? Um, so I guess I just wanted to get your take on like, what's the thing there that's actually bad? And then how does that relate to the issues of, of women in work? I think the primer that I laid uh, in the beginning would sort of uh, help uh, understand things a little better when I answer this question. Yeah. The moment a child is born, um, sex identification of a, a fetus is illegal in India. Mm -hmm. So what they do now is after a girl child is born, they kill the child. Mm -hmm. So we are, we are challenging patriarchy from the moment we are born. Okay, And everything from that point on is a challenge for women workplace or not mm -hmm. our survival is at stake here because if imagine keeping a child inside you for nine months and having it out and instead of loving it you decide to kill it mm -hmm. because only because it's a girl yeah um that's that's a reality for most of us here in india and this happens even today what is it about the sexual harassment that is problematic in many cases you are looked at from top to bottom your qualifications don't matter your skills don't matter yeah uh, the craft you have don't matter but they'll look at you and they'll decide whether or not they want to give you a job so i think that's harassment even before i'm at a workplace and it's also things like what is considered to be a joke you know we were just fooling around we were just we we're just taking a mickey out of you why do you have to take everything so seriously you know um, I used to be married back when I was having a corporate job, but um, I was living in India uh, that time uh, and he was not. So everybody knows that and I would get a lot of these uh, innuendos, mm -hmm. like, you know, oh, so, so what are you doing during weekend? Uh, are you going to call your husband? You know? Yeah. Th these things might seem... Um, Okay, I could pass this for a joke, uh, depending on which side of the bed I woke up that day. Today is no fight day. Today is kill a man day. You know, <laughs> I can de I can decide that. But yeah. these are the things that also matter to, to women. And uh, most of the people quit because of this uh, regular periodic nuisance, which at the face of it doesn't seem like such a big deal. But imagine experiencing that daily, all the time. Yeah. And your promotion depends on it. Your socialization will depend on the privileges that you get in the office. Yeah. So, you know, you will not be allowed in the in-group if you're just too snobbish and you don't want to allow men to harass you. Mm -hmm. if, if you don't allow men to harass you, they would look at you as a stuck-up bitch. Um, and then you would not be taken into consideration when, say, there is travel opportunity, there is an opportunity for you to climb up the ladder in your career and things like that. I, I, and I am speaking only about me uh, when I used to work in an urban setup, in an organized, uh, uh, you know, environment. There are a lot of women that sell flower garlands uh, uh, across the street. Mm -hmm. um, it was pouring and there was this woman who is... Um, sort of haggling with this man mm -hmm. and he's he's definitely not interested in buying anything but he's just trying to sort of talk to her and get some kick out of it and everything this was one occasion where this woman said to me uh, she was selling apples and she said um, apples are I don't know whatever 40 rupees per kilo and he, then the man asks are you charging for the apple or you too gross these microaggressions might yeah be, yeah it, it, it's it's a lot and, yeah, yeah. and there was this one occasion where and these people and these women that are on the streets don't have access to public toilets by the way there are no public toilets sometimes and uh, the state of it is something that we need another whole discussion to talk about yeah and this woman that sells garland it was raining and she badly needed to relieve herself and when it was raining uh, i was stuck in traffic and i'm seeing it from a cab she went to some corner and she relieved herself standing under the rain came back, started conti continued to sell. Mm -hmm. um, if, uh, I don't know, it, it's, it's everything that matters to women at workplace. And uh, it also is important when we talk about workplace, what we mean by that. What is a workplace? I, I, I could feel 
Like somebody is groping me when I'm holding the camera. Should I switch off, turn around, make a complaint, take him to the police station? Also, if a woman is selling something, a man says something or flashes at her and walks away, yes. is she going to leave her shop and go run after him, catch him, go to the police station? Who, again, is going to victimize you? Double vic- the whole process of double, double victimization happens here. Do what, what were you doing? It's not the harassment part of it. It's not the sexual part of it. It's just the very existence of women. Yeah. Contributing to the economy, that's a problem in India. So I was going to ask you more about that. So do you, because I guess there's, there's sort of two different ways I could see it going, like in theory, I guess. So one is it's really a sanction aimed at non-conforming women. So if there's ideas about women's beauty or women's character traits and how women ought to behave towards men, and then it's really the, the non-conforming women that are being sanctioned the most, or is it a more generalized contempt or I don't know hatred whatever you like to call it towards women in general so no matter the woman no matter how conforming she was and in what ways she's always going to be subject to these kind of relentless microaggressions I could get out of the house right now and ask the first girl uh, if she has ever been harassed and she would say yes yeah and I could do it again it's all women and uh, with the with those that are non-conforming they just come after you with more aggression yeah. Because how dare, I, I can't break you, I can't make you wallow, uh, I can't make you f- uh, so fearful of my male dominance, how dare you question my authority that you that you refuse to be harassed by me. Yeah. I'm going to teach you a lesson. And this is across the board. Men can't stand women who can stand up for themselves. And that's the whole thing about patriarchy, right? You and I won't take... Uh, any form of abuse or violence against us. Many women have so many things to think about. Yeah. What if she questions and what if it, that's the boss? What if she loses her job? Where will she go for money? So many women, it's not like anybody enjoys this. I don't think any woman enjoys being harassed or saying, being told these things to them when they can hear it. Hear it. Yeah. Many people require only because they don't have a choice. Yeah. The system in place is not conducive for women to protest to stand up for herself. You give me a system that allows a woman to protest, you see what happens then. Yeah. Not one woman is going to sit down and take all the uh, all the abuses coming her way. Nobody would. I can't remember which woman it was, but there was someone in your documentary, right, who like had an absolutely horrific time with her boss and then ended up having to work with him again, like after the case failed. Oh, sorry, I'm forgetting the details, but... Yeah, in Kerala yeah it's absolutely outrageous like when you think about what that's like to be in a workplace like that and then you know being financially dependent and having to just do your job when someone has treated you like that I mean yeah yeah really uh, she separated the mother with two children and the man knows it and she's living with her parents and he knows how important this job is for her right Um, everybody knows um, that he is an abuser. He's a serial abuser because there were many women before and there was one woman after her. Yeah. No action was taken because he's uh, one of the senior person and he has some clout and he has influence. You don't want to mess with him. And, uh, you know, if he's the one who's going to make decision about who stays in a company who leaves, why is he going to kick himself out? Yeah. No, of course. Yeah. yeah. But that's when you need the laws to be really effective. And then when they're not, it's it's kind of hopeless. Um, yeah. The law has to be impartial in a way that if somebody in a position of power is exercising that sort of power to harass you, um, the law must go after them even more severely. So I wanted to ask you, you've mentioned quite a few things already, I guess, that are feminist issues um, in India. So you just touched quickly on the, the outdoor bathrooms issue, for example. Um, are there any other things that you'd like to mention just in terms of giving the students a bit of a sense of what the feminist yeah. agenda is in India? caste based oppression is like the most important evil that feminists need to immediately look at. It's like, we, we've got to we've got to counter this yesterday. Yeah. The, the longer we take to, the longer we wait to break this oppression, the harder it is going to be for 20 generations from now. The, because we've sort of sat on it for so long, the domino effect far reaches uh, the time in future. You know, so one day, left 
without fighting caste oppression that's 10 years of some girl continuing to live in this hell so caste based oppression is like the most important thing that uh, everybody needs to look up yeah same as feticide of course um and then there is uh, religious oppression female genital mutilation mm-hmm. um that's also very rampant in this one particular community within the muslim uh Mus- islamic islam practicing people mm-hmm. um bora bora muslims they're called and uh, the women there even today they could be modern they could be going to college and everything but uh, back when they were a child they had that experience and yeah. there's a lot of awareness right now but still happens in hashish and during lockdown you know what's happening these uh, women the senior women who are you know uh, who are the heads of making these decisions that women have to undergo fgm are now doubling up and going after these people in their homes because they are now locked down and their um the numbers are going up because Gosh. they are going to their house you can't physically stop them from entering your house so they're going to your house and conducting fgms because earlier it used to be that you have to go to a certain place and they'll perform that horrid thing on yeah, you yeah. and they'll come back yeah. but now they're coming to your house so that's happening Gosh. Uh, there is a, a re- racism that i talked to you about racism and uh, uh, it, access to that somehow there is this asian fetish that sort of uh, makes the people that are belonging to the northeast part of india uh, susceptible to more such sexual violence because they are considered to be women that prostitute themselves mm-hmm. by default mm-hmm. um, they come from a culture where it is a little more progressive for them northeast is like a whole new world you know it's brilliant women actually can walk out freely they can dress however they want they exercise some freedom to a certain extent and when they come back to a city like bombay or chennai and they live their life just like they would back in their homes that's considered to be deviant so they they got to have to be punished for it so women often these women often end up uh, being at the receiving end of a lot of sexual violence right unsolicited you know they they like yeah yeah you you're chinky you deserve this that's usually the way things work things work i've talked to you about dowry i want to talk to you about acid attacks you mentioned that is something that is uh, of interest to you yeah. um ever since the number of cases started uh, spiking there was a section that was introduced in the indian penal code section 326a which basically lays down uh, a punishment for anybody that performs uh, this this act yeah uh the minimum punishment is 10 years of imp- imprisonment and can go up to life but yeah. uh, most of these people get away with it i was worried you were going to say that it's <laughs> yeah. a common yeah. theme yeah we can just we can just say that as a as a de facto situation in india most people get away with it in 2018 there were 9438 um cases of stalking of which a significant percentage of it ended up in acid attacks So these are just for anyone who doesn't know these are like um motivated in romance and rejection is that, is that correct that there's a Mostly, sort of yeah. okay jilted jilted lovers yeah. end up seeking revenge from this uh, girl who thinks she's too, too pretty I'm going to teach her a lesson I'm going to make her face look so deformed that no man would want her Fuck. she can't have if she won't have me she has Nobody no one. Have her. it's such an extravagant manifestation of men feeling that they are owed something from women like i can't i mean it's just so extreme to be like she wrongs she really wrongs me when she denies me at to the point where i'm i can take retribution i mean yes. wow that's that's a that's a funny thing because acid is available over the counter without any prescription you can basically buy a bottle of it and you can throw it at anybody it doesn't matter yeah. contraception not available over the counter yeah They were I was okay. looking into this recently because they'd ruled out being able to buy acid over the counter and now I can't remember what countries it was maybe the UK and Australia precisely for these reasons that some people were doing sort of bringing that practice and then doing it and they were trying to find ways to regulate it out like okay at least if we make the acid not available then then people won't be able to do this it seems like such yeah, a sensible you know what will happen right it will be sold in black it will be sold on a high price and it will happen on the down low it will never stop happening the thing with india is if you want to cause harm you will do it no matter what yeah especially against women i have i have heard of cases that that just seem like so much effort on the part of the man but because he has made up my made up his mind to doing it he will do it 
Yeah. Uh, I mentioned stalking. The stalking is also such a huge, huge problem, uh, and it, which then manifests into something very, very dangerous to the women because these stalkers think that they are Romeos. They are going after these women because it's a symbol of love, and that uh, he is so interested in her, and that's what uh, films and media and everything teaches you these days, right? Uh, in in all the films that we watch in India. Uh, a man who's talking a woman, eventually the woman says yes and they're living happily ever after. Who's making the film? A man. Anybody ask the woman how she's feeling about being stalked and forced into loving somebody? Nobody asked that. Nobody yes. has made a film about that. Nobody is going to get money for making a film about that. Yeah. You know, it's not that people don't want to watch it. They won't even let it, let it get made. Yeah. So the stalking thing became a huge crisis in a in a, in a broad daylight in a railway station in my city. There was this girl, and a man just came and lynched her, killed her, just killed her. And people watched it, and she fell right down there. And trains kept passing, and it was a while before anybody could come and do something about it. I don't know, call an ambulance, anything. Yeah. But she was just there, and that's not an isolated case. And that sort of sparked so many references and films in a way that it was glorifying it. It is such a shame. I can't understand for the life of me how men can take a real life brutality yeah. and, in the name of ex- educating people, glorify it in their film. And in the end, somewhere you may not even say it, but in the in the end, you may say that, oh no, that's wrong. Who's going to listen to the? fine print yeah. nobody is but you're glorifying this as an act of true love like you loved her and then you know in some cases these men go kill themselves too it's like eternal love like he he killed her and he killed himself so um yeah 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 it's, yeah. it's really stupid and, and and this stems directly from the lack of uh, sex education influence of pornography uh, poor body image issues for men um, the sort of entitlement that media teaches you it's like a whole confusing concoction put together in a male brain mm-hmm. that makes men act in all these ridiculous ways mm-hmm. but that we and, and there's the porn and uh, this thing has so many correlation between domestic violence and sexual abuse in general too there was a case uh, i written an article about it 17 18 year old boys were talking in a private chat then the chat was called boys locker room guess where they got that from boys locker room and they're discussing about in detail about how they can gang rape a fourteen-year-old girl student from the from their school. And guess what? The kind of nomenclatures they were using: anal, mm. DP, double penetration, and how it's totally doable. And they're laughing about how she's young and she might not be able to take it. And and this man, is, this boy is assuring them that she can. The bitch can. Where are you telling me that? People learn the word double penetration from yeah. textbooks. Yeah, of course not. And this is the same country that is claiming that porn is empowering, Holly. But they, they see all these instances as a as a offshoot, right? This is so this is so bad. But porn is empowering. This is bad, but porn is empowering. Nobody does that because so many people are benefiting from it. There's so much money to be made in exploiting women. So nobody does the big brother. We can like pretend to be annoyed by these youngsters and claim the education system is to be the education system's failure because they don't teach sex education properly prostitution it is an 8 billion dollar a year industry yeah. in india and this- there are no brothels there are no brothels it's not even like they're doing it in hiding anymore because uh, people are corrupt and there is an understanding because the people that are supposed to question them are the recipients of such service so what can you do yeah and these are young girls traffic from different parts of the country, different parts of the world, Bangladesh, Nepal, uh, lack of sanitation, uh, homosexuality, suicides, uh, being a lesbian is a huge problem, being gay is a huge problem, so kids kill themselves. I'm not even going to get into the trans thingy yet because it's catching up, but uh, we need another day to completely discuss about that. And there is uh, uh, lack of sanitation that I mentioned about, but then what I didn't mention back then is uh, when, when women openly defecate, uh, studies show that uh, so many of them are sexually abused when they are out there in such a vulnerable position. Uh-huh. And uh, lack of toilets and uh, access to clean water and facilities um, has increased uh, percentage of people getting uh, 
you know, OBGYN related sicknesses, especially if they're pregnant, the chances of the kid getting something even before she, she, he or she is born is pretty high Yeah. because of, of uh, the lack of sanitation and things like that. Yeah. And of course, you have your um, lack of opportunities for women in positions of power, people who decide that women need rights. Uh, they don't even allow women to get there. Yeah. They cite all kinds of other uh, reasons that women don't do a job properly, they go away on maternity leave. Who is making them pregnant? <laughs> yeah, fair question. Yeah. So, so, so can, can I ask you if you were, I mean, it's a slightly silly question and then I've got one more for you before we before we wrap up. But um, if if we just could make you like the queen of feminism in India and, and give you a I huge, huge amount of money. <laughs> um, I, I think the men are. Yeah, okay. Yeah. That's your intervention. I was going to say, yeah. what's your big, what's your big innovation? Like, <laughs> yeah, no, I think the men are. <laughs> Great. I think the men are. We have uh, 924 females per thousand males. Um, they will figure it out. Yeah, good. Uh, I'll kick them out. I'll probably give them one really, like a desert or something in India and I'll <laughs> contain them over there so they'll know what it feels like, all of them together. Yeah. Um, Maybe yeah. maybe once you've built the feminist utopia, the female-only utopia, you can let some of them back in once you've sort of re-educated and um, built a new culture that they have to kind of enculturate into. Yeah, but they'll be under very, very strict scrutiny. <laughs> Good. Extremely strict scrutiny because uh, we can't afford to have any access we got here. We can't let this pass us. Yeah. So <laughs> I'd really want to keep them in up. All of them, even the ones I love. I don't care. Yeah. So that's good. It's a throwback to the uh, the second wave separatism, which I haven't talked to my students about yet, but um, but maybe now this is a good excuse. So final question before we're done, um, and this is just something really about global feminism. So uh, we talked in one of the lectures about um, this we're talking about the idea of women as a caste and like thinking about this kind of global social group women and the interests that women have in common um and i had a passage uh in the lecture from christina hoff summer's book you know she's like the the femin feminist critic <laughs> um and she was talking about like how it's a problem that privileged women can point to uh, really disadvantaged women somewhere else in their country or even somewhere else in the world and sort of make this claim about how like when, when, like whenever she is harmed we are all harmed right and I think Summers was thinking that there's something suspicious about that move um, and I guess like I found that an interesting claim because I'm I'm very tempted to think there is this global cast and it has a lot in common and I'm I'm quite keen on a sex-based rights movement. Um, but so I guess I just wanted to sort of put that to you as the last thing. Like, do you see any kind of interesting tensions there or do you see a way that like more privileged women in other parts of the world can be sort of supportive or good allies without like claiming victimhood when they don't actually experience any, I guess? Yeah. Um, you could say that I'm the white woman in my country because I, I was born in a family that even though we were, we were not upper class, we were uh, a very extremely modest household. My caste uh, supersedes my lower class. Yeah. So by being born in an upper caste, I sort of seek privileges of all other things which, in which the money, the financial, economic capital doesn't seem like a, like a hindrance at all because I can make up for it by getting access to a lot of spaces that many women don't have access to. That's a landscape. Uh, the most, I don't know, the queen, maybe the queen is uh, having everything at her disposal, but she is also not free from casual sexism, I'm sure. Yeah. Everybody, the newspaper doesn't let her go. The, everybody makes memes out of her. Yeah. If, <laughs> and we know what happened to um, Megan. Yeah, we know what happened to that. So if you're talking about women in privileged positions are just simply whining about uh, somebody else's oppression and claiming that because just because they're part of the same sex class, then yeah. we are also oppressed. Everybody is oppressed, but differently. You can't, you can't say that somebody else's oppression 
is the reason why you are feeling oppressed. No, that's not what we should say. Yeah. But we should be able to question that that woman is oppressed. Therefore, it is my prerogative to make sure that the oppression is free, uh, that the, the, the woman is oppression is free. not just me, but her too. But do you so, see that as being a relationship between like allies, like these women can be good allies and help these women? Or do you think it's true when they say there's a sense in which these are harms to women and we're all women, right? Mm. So it's like, oh, we, we, like, we are harmed. Does that make mm. sense? Like, yeah, it does make sense. Oh, so I, I kind of get uh, irked sometimes by the Anglo-Saxon umbrella of feminism, which then get templated into developing countries. But that's not to say that one feminism can fit for all of us. Yeah. I, I do want to believe that I will fight for women regardless of her position in the hierarchy, in the pyramid. Yeah. For the longest time, I was also this social justice person to say that I shouldn't appropriate someone else's fight or I shouldn't appropriate her oppression or something like that. But then, you know what I did? I started questioning my, um, my section, mm-hmm. right? So if I belong to a section in the pyramid, I started going horizontally. There was a time when I'd be like, oh, if, Dal- if a Dalit woman uh, is killed for uh, marrying into somebody who's belonging to an upper caste, for example, oh, that's another thing, oh, it's called honor killing, mm. but that comes up in the caste thing. So if you if you marry into a caste that that is above you or below you, the family doesn't approve of it, the bride and the groom will get killed. Yeah, so I can't say then that that woman getting killed because she's belonging to a lower caste, it is not my fight. I used to think that, but I no longer think that. I think it is my fight. Yeah. Because she's a woman and I see her as one one sex class. It's us. It's it's us. That's why in my film too, if you notice, I have I have interviewed a CEO and I have interviewed a woman that represents manual scavengers. Yeah. All of them are against a black background. Yeah. They are all speaking as one unit, as one woman. I could I could show a woman working in an office. That's her workplace. But how do I show a woman that is picking shit out of public toilets? That's her workplace. That's voyeuristic and that's wrong. And the, and the fact that the woman is doing that, I should be stopping her and not filming her. Yeah. You know, that is also my fight, I think. But I wouldn't say, I wouldn't um, um, delude myself into thinking that I have all the privileges only she does not. Yeah. That's also not true. Yeah. Uh, we, we all, we all sort of... Uh, navigate through patriarchy in our own way we shouldn't be careless enough to say that someone who is far less privileged privileged their oppression and our oppression are the same yeah. but at the same time we shouldn't rid ourselves of the responsibility to fight for that woman too yeah i think that's i think that would summarize my feelings about it i will no longer say things like well i, I think it would be wrong if i appropriate their struggles Come on! Yeah, there's a there's a woman at risk, and I want to help her. That's all I'm thinking about at that point. Yeah, brilliant. I, it was a very good answer. Um, okay, let's leave it there because I think we've uh, we've been going for quite a long time. Thank you so much for talking to me. It's been super interesting, and I really appreciate your time. Thank you so much. I hope uh, I hope the students find something good out of it, and I hope they ask you a lot of questions. Yeah, I'm sure they will. <laughs>